Hello everyone. Um, for our course this semester, we'll be talking about a few or a variety of topics um, ranging from human uh, evolutionary history to cultural diversity to um, the history of historic uh, scientific racism. So as we move through kind of the semester, you might be thinking to yourself, uh, you know, how do all of these topics kind of um, come together? Well, Really, it's kind of under this arcing discipline known as anthropology, right? Um, anthropology literally comes from the Greek words um, uh, logos and uh, anthropos, right, which means the study of man. Um, so essentially, uh, anthropology covers basically anything that is associated with humans and the culture which they produce, right? So um, before we kind of get into uh, some of the material from our textbooks and things like that, um, we're going to go over briefly just what the heck is anthropology. So anthropology in and of itself is uh, what we call a holistic discipline. It's a discipline which tries to incorporate as many facets in a study as possible, right? So as a, uh, for example, if you're a cultural anthropologist and you're going to uh, do a study on a tribal culture in South America, you're not just going to look at the religious practices, you're going to look at everything from that culture, from the religion to the language to the settlement patterns to the the uh, kinship patterns, right? How do they uh, call each other in terms of relation and things like that, right? So holism really is a theory that kind of uh, states that the parts of a whole are an intimate interconnection with each other, right? Such that they cannot exist independently of the whole or cannot be understood without reference to the whole, right? So in essence, in terms of um, humans, right, you cannot understand human culture without understanding the uh, environment that they live in. You can't, uh, if we were to take an example from history or archaeology, you can't understand the past of a given culture or anything like that without looking at the historical records and looking at how they view their history today, right? So holism is really this notion of kind of taking as many aspects of a uh, study as possible and incorporating them into your research. Along with the notions of holism, anthropology is also multidisciplinary, right? Then this is just a fancy word for saying, you know, we try to consult with as many experts as possible when conducting uh, research, right? So it's not uncommon for anthropological endeavors to have people from multiple disciplines participating. Um, a good example of this would be uh, in terms of, you know, let's say you're an archaeologist and you dig up a um, human burial and the individuals wearing clothing, right? Well, as an archaeologist, you can determine the age of the burial and know that it's 2,000 or, you know, uh, plus years old, but how do you determine what kind of material was used for the clothing, right? That's when you would go to a chemist or you would go to a textile expert and they would be able to inform you on what type of material was used for the clothing on your burial, right? So it's this whole notion of bringing in experts from various fields so that your study has the strongest and the most uh, validity, right, so that you can be very confident in the statements that you're making in your research. Specific to anthropology is this notion of intersectionality, right, which is looking at the interconnected nature of social categories such as race, class, and gender as they apply to a given individual group, right? And this is kind of um, just the notion of when you're looking at things like race, you also look at things like gender and class as well, right? You're not just looking at one specific facet of a given individual, right? Because all of those things influence one another, right? So they're all interconnected. So anthropology in and of itself is a multi-field discipline. Um, it consists of five subfields, um, archaeology, and we, don't worry, we will briefly define um, each of them. But it consists of archaeology, biological, or sometimes referred to as physical anthropology, cultural anthropology, linguistics, as well as applied anthropology. 
So if we look at archaeology on a very base definition, it's the study of past peoples and cultures through the material remains they leave behind, right? Material remains can include everything from ceramics to stone tools, and in even some cases, if we want to talk about biological uh, remains that are left behind, um, your skeletons, right? Because uh, your body and your bones can actually inform us um, a lot on past life ways and diets and things like that. Um, just by, you know, doing chemical examinations of your skeleton. Um, so in essence, archaeology is using materials that we find in the ground to reconstruct how people may have lived in the past. So unfortunately, really, the work of archaeology is not nearly as exciting as some Hollywood depictions like Indiana Jones. Um, you would really be surprised to know that in many, many cases, um, in my own experience as an archaeologist, um, there are a lot of times you will dig a site and you will find next to nothing. You might find a couple arrowheads, you know, you might find a couple uh, pieces of pottery but not much else, right? So archaeology is really kind of, um, you know, hit or miss in terms of where you think materials may be. And archaeology, essentially, um, one of the big jokes that we have is that we learn to dig really neat holes. Um, so and what we mean by this is that we meticulously document each layer of soil, right? Because from our, our lessons in uh, high school and grade school geology, we know that the earth was laid down in layers, right? So when you uh, document those layers, they almost act as kind of a timeline for you. Um, going further back in time, the deeper that you dig, right? So when we find artifacts, the location of each artifact is noted in both vertical and horizontal space, right? And archaeologists construct what's called a profile map, right? Or a map of the wall, essentially, of your, uh, your excavation, right? Showing where artifacts have been found in the different layers of soil, right? If you look at the picture to the right, you can see uh, they marked the various layers of the soil with uh, looks like yarn or wire. So archaeology itself is an extremely diverse field. Some archaeologists will focus on exclusively ceramic vessels or arrowheads, and others will focus on skeletal materials and byproducts of life, right? So if you're interested on uh, kind of more the biological end of um, archaeology, you can look at my own research on fossilized tooth plaque from a prehistoric fishing village in northwestern uh, Ohio from about 1,000 years ago. So if we look at a case study in um, archaeology, right, we have the case of um, a 30,000-year-old baby mammoth named Layuba, right? She was found in 2007 in the northern uh, Yamal Peninsula in Siberia. And the uh, what made her kind of unique is that um, based on the way she died and uh, kind of how the conditions are up in that far north, um, she was perfectly preserved. Um, so far as that we had the fur, the skin, the bones, we even had the contents of the stomach, right? So we were, knew that she was eating various grasses as well as still milk feeding from her mother, right? And we were even able to determine the cause of death, which was asphyxiation from mud clogging her airways. So essentially, we kind of hypothesized that she may have died um, by getting caught in a mud pit, right? Being unable to free herself. Um, so I believe the next image will show you kind of how perfect the preservation for Lyuba was. If we look at another case study in archaeology, um, we look at uh, it's kind of a classic case study uh, from a period called, <clears throat> or from a pyramid called in Cosquequi. Uh, Ecuador, right? The city was founded in 1000 AD. It was a previously unfound uh, society, and it showed how construction in Middle America worked during this kind of post-classic period. Um, and they also found ceramics, arrowheads, and an entire pyramid. And what made this important was it showed that um, in that area during that time, those indigenous people, they were building these large pyramids, but they were not independent structures, right? In essence, they were building pyramids on top of pyramids on top of pyramids, right? So when they wanted to build a new one, they would simply tear down the old one or keep it intact and build a new one around it, right? Kind of creating this onion effect in the buildings, right? So when archaeologists dig down into these uh, pyramid structures, we start finding pyramids that are older and older and older and older the further down we dig.
So archaeology is not the same everywhere, right? The field methods for archaeology can vary depending on the type of site you are working on, right? For example, if you're an underwater archaeologist, we can't really draw profile maps um, of their test pits because in some cases they are unable to get, dig any, right? Uh, it's really hard to dig a hole underwater. Uh, and the field of archaeology is essentially broken up today by geography, right? So I myself am considered a New World archaeologist, and more specifically, um, I'm a New World archaeologist that focuses on the eastern woodlands of the United States, right? So I don't even really focus on the west or southwest of the country, right? And time is not the same in all regions, right? For example, the Iron Age or the start of the Iron Age will vary dramatically depending on the society that you're looking at. So the overall goal of archaeology is to essentially present a snapshot of the past based off of these material remains that are left behind by past people. If we look at biological slash physical anthropology, on the other hand, this is a branch of anthropology that studies the origins of the human species as using comparative anatomy, right? So biological anthropologists seek to illuminate our evolutionary history using evidence from the fossil record of not just humans, but also our closest living relatives, right? And there's even a behavioral aspect to this as well, right? Uh, a lot of biological anthropologists will conduct behavior studies on modern primates because we are so genetically similar to primates that we will actually, you know, have see a lot of behavioral correlates between us and them. So looking at just some of the various topics in biological anthropology, um, some uh, anthropologists will study bipedality in humans or the development of walking on two legs, since it is such a fundamental adaptation in our species. Uh, some will uh, focus on behavioral comparisons, like I said, with other living primates. Uh, some will focus on changes in the human skeleton over time, right? How did our skull change? How has our spinal column changed? Uh, you also have forensics, right? Uh, determining uh, using forensic evidence to uh, um, prove crimes and, and kind of help solve crimes. Uh, you also have how DNA affects skeletal structures across species, right? There's now a big genetic component looking at how genes and the manipulation of genes can affect the changes in different skeletal structures and how those genes are common amongst not just humans, but multiple species across the globe. If we look at a case study in biological slash physical anthropology, we have a, the case study of Neanderthals eating their greens, right? At one point, we thought Neanderthals were exclusively meat eaters, but a couple researchers named Karen Hardy and Dolores Paperno um, looked at uh, dental calculus, which is fossilized tooth plaque, and found a whole mess of starch grains, right? So it disproved the notion that Neanderthals only ate meat, and the findings were based on calculus from specimens of the El Cedrone cave in southern Spain, right? It recon essentially reconstructed a diet from roughly 50,000 years ago, right? And not only did they find starch grains, but they found gelatinized starch grains, which means that the Neanderthals were not only eating plants, but they were cooking those plants as well before eating them. So this is showing you the fossilized tooth plaque. You can kind of see the buildup towards the uh, base of the tooth, right where you have the enamel um, and dentin junction. Um, and the uh, pictures above you can see are, this is what gelatinized starch grains look like um, under regular microscopy as well as polarized light microscopy. So they're pretty distinguishable based on their shape, size, and what reflection they give under the polarized light. So we can use those information um, to uh, identify which plant species these starch grains may have come from. We have another case study looking at when did our species start consuming uh, non-human milk, right, which is kind of unique to our species. They're very, uh, it's not common at all uh, for animals to drink other animals' milk. Um, uh, there's a University of Oklahoma anthropologist named Christiana Warner looked at the dental calculus from 5,000 year old human remains from the Middle East, and she discovered specific milk, milk proteins, right? So she's saying that the first milks came from cattle, sheep, and goats in that Fertile Crescent area of the Middle East, right? But the uh, evidence is tenuous, right? And I can tell you this uh, based on my own research that um, 
proteins themselves do not uh, preserve in dental calculus, right? Only their fossilized shells do. And uh, we know from biology that proteins are very complicated 3D structures. So it would be really hard to reconstruct what specific protein was just based on the outline of its shell, right? Because a lot of those times those shells are fragmentary. If we look at another study, we have the uh, environmental reconstruction of the environment of Australopithecus afarensis, otherwise known as Lucy. This was done by Denise Sue from the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. She obtained fossils, sediments, and pollen from an outcropping of rock dating to between two to five million years uh, in that middle Awash region in Ethiopia, right? And what she did is she uh, essentially took that and worked with those materials to reconstruct the environment using all the different pieces of evidence that those uh, materials uh, furnished. So Dr. Sue's work uh, further supported the notion that bipedality likely developed in a region which was still forested. So that whole notion that we started walking on two legs because we were losing the trees and the savanna was coming. Um, is not true, right? Uh, because uh, essentially the environment was pleasantly warm with an abundance of fruit bearing trees and root vegetable plants. There were some savannas that the forest was broken up by, but there was also an abundance and diversity of animal species from small lemur like creatures to large predatory cats and dogs, all of which would have lived in a forested habitat, right? So Lucy and the development of bipedality did not uh, come about because of the grasslands, right? Because the trees were disappearing. Um, there's some other explanation as to why humans began walking on two legs. Our next field of anthropology or subfield of anthropology is linguistics, which is the study of the construction, use, and form of language in human populations. Um, and we won't really go into uh, too much linguistics in this course in terms of uh, looking at things like semantics and pragmatics and stuff like that. Um, they, they cover that in linguistics and cultural anthropology courses, um, but it is a subfield um, that a lot of anthropologists study. So linguists may study things like the composition of language, language borrowing, uh, how do languages borrow words from one another, um, how languages interact and change over time, as well as classifying languages based on similarity. If we look at a case study in linguistic anthropology, I like to use the cracking of the Maya code, right? There's actually a book Call uh, with the same title, um, if you're interested in this kind of topic. The Mayan hieroglyphic writing system was worked on by scholars for uh, almost 100 years. It was discovered in the late 1800s, um, essentially the hieroglyphic writing, and it wasn't really cracked or the alphabet was not cracked until the mid 1980s. Now today we can really fully decipher most of the Mayan language. Um, some glyphs or some hieroglyphs are still kind of uh, a mystery to us, but uh, in the 1980s, we really realized that each of those glyphs were actually broken up into different components, and each of those components corresponded to an actual uh, sound um, or a part of a sound for a word. So in essence, we were able to um, use those components to reconstruct entire sentences and realize that these hieroglyphs we were finding on all these monuments were retelling the history of the Mayan kings and queens from Central America. Another subfield that we look at is cultural anthropology, right, which is the study of people's communities, behaviors, beliefs, and institutions, including how people make and construct meaning within society, right, or what symbols do people use within their own culture. And anthropologists use a very specific definition for culture, right? It's the complex whole, which includes knowledge, beliefs, arts, morals, laws, customs, and any other capabilities acquired by a human as a member of society, right? This is our most comprehensive definition. It was originally written in 1881 by an anthropologist, one of the earliest anthropologists named Edward Burnett Tyler. If we look at a case study in... Uh, cultural anthropology, we have uh, Clifford Geertz and the Balinese cockfighting. To illustrate, this kind of illustrates the notion of actions as symbols, right? Geertz looked at the practice of cockfighting in the uh, island of Bali, right, in Indonesia. 
So according to Geertz, uh, Balinese cockfighting is not just Balinese cockfighting, right? The cockfight itself represents generations of competition between cockfighting families uh, within local villages in Bali, right? It also represents a negotiation of those families' prestige, power, and ability to garner resources within the village they live, right? So, i.e., cockfighting in Bali is much more than the act of having two animals fight one another for sport, right? It's really about kind of this culturally cemented notion of prestige, power, and heritage. The final subfield that we'll talk about is the uh, applied anthropology, right? This is using anthropological techniques to solve humanitarian crises -ish, uh, facing Western and non-Western cultures, right? This is basically um, what a lot of textbooks and what your textbook will refer to as cultural anthropology because um, in terms of cultural anthropology, there really is no long lost culture or long lost tribes out there to really go and discover and study anymore, right? Which is really the kind of early foundation of a culture cultural anthropology is. So today, a lot of cultural anthropologists focus on trying to solve humanitarian issues. An example that I'll give from a colleague of mine that works in Senegal, um, he noticed, you know, in Senegal, there's a very, very high malarial infection rate in a lot of tribal villages. And this is because in the tribal villages, they have a practice of placing a bowl of water next to the door so that the person can wash their hands and feet before they come into the house. Well, that bowl of water rarely gets changed and the serves as a perfect breeding ground for um, the Anopheles mosquito, which transmits malaria. Um, so my colleague went in there with a team of anthropologists and convinced the people to uh, use this little vial of bleach and place one drop of bleach in the water um, you know, once a week. And what that does is it prevents the uh, malarial parasite, or more importantly, the mosquitoes from reproducing in that water, right? So they were able to solve or kind of diminish the infection rates of malaria in the area um, by using kind of a, or kind of uh, supplementing a cultural practice. So anthropology has a unique pr approach to understanding human uh, societies, right? We seek to promote cultural understanding and illuminate the scope of human diversity, both cultural and biological, right? We essentially seek to dispel ethnocentrism, right? Which is a strong human tendency to believe that their own culture or your own culture or way of life is natural, normal, and superior to the beliefs and practices of other cultures, right? So this is really just kind of asking everyone to take a step back and say, no, we don't have the right to judge the cultural practices of other groups of people, right, in most cases. So in terms of cultural anthropology, um, how do they present their findings? Well, cultural anthropologists engage in a type of research called participant observation, right? This means that they participate in the daily lives of the people from the culture they are studying. So the anthropologist records everything they see and hear during their field work and field journals, right? So cultural anthropologists will generally compile their findings into two types of worth, right? Ethnographies versus ethnologies. And ethnography is the systematic study of a people and culture. It's your kind of comprehensive description of cultural practices of a given people. Uh, a uh, essentially, an ethnology, on the other hand, is when you take multiple ethnographies and you look for common threads between multiple cultures, right? You're, so essentially, you're using uh, essentially a comparison of cultural features across multiple cultures in a specific geographic region. So now we kind of get on to our topic and our main topic for what we'll be covering in most of this course is the notion of studying human diversity, right? How diverse are humans, right? How diverse are humans biologically versus how diverse are humans culturally? So in essence, our central questions are, well, how are diverse are humans, right? How do humans vary from each other genetically? What role does geography play in that variation? And what effect does culture have on human biological diversity? And finally, of course, and this is going to be kind of a recurring topic and something that's particularly salient given uh, recent events in the U.S. and around the world, is what is race? How is it constructed? And how has it affected 
Um, and more importantly, how has science played a role uh, historically in creating and perpetuating this notion of race? We talk about how race is this cultural mechanism, which it is, but we also have to take into account that scientists have spent decades and decades providing uh, relatively uh, very unvalid scientific studies, which provide a foundation or a validity to the kind of cultural mechanisms uh, affecting race, right? Policies, um, segregation, um, things like that, right? Discrimination. So in terms of the topics, we will cover everything from race to sexuality, to human blood groups, to parasitic diseases, and we'll also look at differences in phenotypic expression or why do humans look differently on the outside. In terms of race, we'll be looking at whether or not there is a biological foundation for race, and uh, I will give you a bit of a spoiler, uh, there is not a biological foundation for race. Um, why are there variations on skin tone, right? Why do we have such a wide variety of people who have very dark skin tones, people who have very light skin tones, and every kind of shade in between? Is there a cultural basis for race, right? And what role does vitamin D play in all of this? We will talk about all of those things. And we will also talk about human sexuality, right? How does human sexuality or human sexual expression vary, right? Why do we have different expressions of human sexuality? And how does human biological and cultural diversity play a role in the expression of human sexuality, right? And we're talking about sexuality in terms of, uh, as kind of an umbrella term that kind of incorporates uh, both the biological and cultural aspects. So we will be looking at things like notions on gender versus notions about biological sex versus notions about sexual expression and sexuality. So we'll be looking at human blood group adaptations, right? Why do humans have different blood types, right? Have you ever wondered why do we have an A, an O, and a B blood types, right? So why do we have this uh, kind of a situation when we know that, you know, we are part of the same species? Why don't we all just have the same blood type, right? So what role does disease play in human blood variation? What role do other chromosomal adaptations play in the human species, right? We'll kind of do a brief overview of a few. So this is showing you some of the kind of variations that we'll be looking at in terms of the diversity of humans, right? We'll look at uh, kind of the LCD or LC, excuse me, LCT regulatory gene, um, which uh, opens up a pathway which allows milk digestion. So we'll look at things like lactose intolerance. We'll look at why there's a variation in earwax type. Uh, as well as a variation in sweating, right? Some human groups sweat more than others. We will also look at parasitic diseases, right? And yes, you are seeing a picture of a worm being pulled out of someone's leg. Um, so we're going to look at really uh, parasitic diseases in terms of how have they interacted with our species over time. Yes, we won't really get into the nitty gritty grossness of parasitic diseases, but they are very important to our species, right? Because they, they do present selective pressure in terms of evolutionary uh, history, right? So how does human biological diversity affect affect parasitic disease response, right? Are there humans who are more resistant to certain parasitic diseases than others? Uh, how have humans changed the evolution of parasitic diseases over time as well? So just to kind of give you a little bit of a shock and scare factor here, right? You have cystocerosis or cystocercosis. Um, up to one in 10 people hospitalized for neurocystocercosis in the United States die from the preventable parasitic disease, right? And it's really interesting where we get this disease from. So just kind of click over to the next slide to find the shocking truth. You can get this disease from a toxoplasmosis or toxoplasmid that comes from, you guessed it, your fuzzy neighborhood cat, right? And actually up to 18% of the U.S. population has toxoplasmosis that has been transmitted to them through their cat. The issue is, is that as a young person and, you know, uh, as a normal functioning adult and child, you don't really deal with the side effects of this parasitic disease because your immune system keeps it in check. But as you age and as your immune system becomes less and less effective towards the end of your life, that's when you start to see that uh, cystocercosis forming and some of the other side effects from this toxoplasmid uh, disease. 
So we'll also look at differences in phenotypic expression, right? How does the variation we see in our faces play a role in our adaptive responses, right? What variation do we see in the human uh, facial cranial proportions, right? And what role does brain size variation play? And I will give you a small hint. There is a lot of variation in brain size, and brain size does not, in any sense, correlate to intelligence. So here you kind of see uh, just kind of the difference between uh, modern human species, uh, Homo neanderthalensis and Homo denisovan. Uh, and you can see there's a lot of differences in the skull shape and size, right? But all of these creatures essentially um, had a lot of the same similar cultural elements, right? Humans made clothing, Neanderthals made clothing, humans lived in family groups, Neanderthals lived in family groups as well as Denisovans. Um, so it's really just to go to show you, it's not really the size of the brain that matters, it's the organization within that brain. Um, and with that, that kind of concludes our introductory lecture for what is anthropology. So we'll start kind of getting into more detail. Um, and as we move through the semester, just to give you a small hint, there is a lot of reading. There's not a whole lot of assignments, or, or rather the assignments are relatively short, and there's only two exams, but there is a lot of reading in this course. So um, as long as you bear with us and you get the two books and you do the reading and you at least go through the PowerPoints, you should be relatively successful in the course. I will tell you that in terms of studying for exams, you will want to focus more heavily on the Anamone book. The Gould book uh, is more just kind of for the background information, right? So most of your test material comes out of the Robert Anamone book. Um, so with that, we will kind of move on, make sure you review each lecture each week, and you do the assignment uh, that's posted each week.